All right, I'm showing uh, 11.02, so let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, pleased to have you join us in the webinar today. Again, it's, uh, it looks like a really diverse group of nonprofits with us. I'm sure uh, a mix of people who are used to applying for grants, uh, as well as people who are just getting used to it. So hopefully we get all your questions uh, answered today. That's what this is all about. So thanks to Denise for, for joining us. It's greatly appreciated all the way from Victoria. And uh, just a little bit about Denise and her expertise. So Denise, uh, Mahan, did I say that correctly? <laughs> it's yeah. Mahan, but no one gets it right. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, nobody gets my last name right either. So I apologize. I know how that yeah. hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Denise is the manager of policy and community outreach with the Community Gaining Grants branch. Previously to this role, Denise has held various positions within government related to the sports sector, not-for-profits, and for-profit sector, as well as employment and training programs. So thanks so much, Denise. Uh, I know people are really excited to hear, you know, your uh, your expertise today about how to maybe create the most successful um, applications for grants and and uh, and uh, yeah. So mostly, I'll just leave this up to you. Um, so I'll let you go through the presentation, and uh, if you are watching today, uh, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. So Denise has said usually people ask questions, and she. Uh, generally answers them through the presentation. So if there's any added questions, we'll go through that at the end as well. And I'll help yeah. uh, moderate those. So we'll right. leave you, Denise. Okay, sounds good. Um, so thank you for the introduction and thanks uh, to the chamber for um, inviting me here today, um, here being where I am and you being where you are. Um, usually in the past, we actually would do these in person, but that's that's not happening these days. But it's actually been, you know, the silver lining is that we're able to do a lot more of these types of sessions. So um, yeah, so it's really great to be here. Um, I'm very happy to talk to you guys about our program and let you know uh, a little bit about what we're all about. Um, so if you're somebody that is a returning applicant, hopefully this will be a good refresher um, and maybe you'll learn something new. Um, and if you're new to our program, this will go over everything that you need to know um, in order to apply. Um, and as Dan mentioned, we'll take some questions at the end if there are, are more specific things you wanna get into um, or uh, there was something that maybe wasn't answered. Um, as well, I'll, I'll leave off with some resources at the end, which I'll kind of be referring to throughout the presentation, um, which again is just, you know, super helpful in your own time. You can go through some of the, the documents that I'll mention, um, and I'll also leave with some contact information for both myself and others in our branch um, if there are any lingering questions that might pop up after this or as you're going through and preparing your application. So hopefully you'll leave with a whole bunch of information um, and better informed. Um, so, so yeah, as mentioned, I am manager of policy and community outreach with our program. So my role is to kind of do some of that policy work when we do make those changes through the year um, to our guidelines and things like that, um, but also to hold these kinds of sessions and answer questions and help kind of interpret um, the policy with respect to your program and how that applies to you. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get going here. Um, well, if you have questions, uh, you can, I guess, pop them in the chat and we'll, we'll see if we need to address those afterwards, um, or maybe they'll be answered through the course of the session, but, uh, let's get going, shall we? So um, usually when we're all together, we do the acknowledgement of traditional land. Um, I am obviously in a different location than all of you, so I will acknowledge my traditional land, um, but uh, I'll give you a, an opportunity to kind of think about where you're calling in from. So I'm calling in from Victoria, um, which is the unceded territory of the Lekwungen people, um, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I'm very grateful to live, work, and play here um, on these beautiful lands. Um, the one thing I didn't mention, actually, I, Dan and I were talking about this beforehand. Um, I've, you might notice there's a cat tree behind me, which is currently populated with cats. Um, they do like to make an appearance, so I usually turn off my webcam during this part, um, just so I don't get distracted and you don't get distracted, and we can just focus on the presentation itself. So I'm just going to pop off video, but I will return. Okay, so um, I'm just going to quickly go over what we'll cover today. I'm going to spend a bit of time at the top talking about what's new for this year for our grant program. I'll then talk about the program essentials, organization eligibility, program eligibility, 
um, what you do when you have the grant money and what you can spend it on, um, what you do to apply. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about our $5 million separate capital project grant program, um, as well as leaving off with some resources at the end. So first off, what is new for this year? Um, I've obviously, I think everyone is <laughs> very keenly aware that COVID-19 has been the biggest uh, story in all of our lives for the past year. Um, you know, the, the not-for-profit sector has really quickly pivoted to continue to provide those essential services to British Columbians, um, and including a lot of vulnerable people who have really been affected by this outbreak the most. Um, we have heard throughout from organizations who have had to modify or cancel their programming and services uh, because of COVID-19. Um, and the, the challenging financial situation that this has really left um, everyone in. So in response to what we heard in early spring last year, we adapted our program policies and procedures, and we're going to be continuing many of these for the current grant year. Um, so we've relaxed and adapted several of our program criteria, uh, really just with the aim of making sure that our program continues to be flexible um, and, and to make sure that organizations can continue to be eligible for our funding. So some of the things that we've done um, in this respect is we have opened our human and social services early again this year in June, um, just recognizing the increased demand that this sector has seen um, and their need to be able to respond in a, a timely manner. So that's, uh, so that's a bit different. Um, another thing we've done is we've relaxed our operating surplus criteria for return applicants. Um, just recognizing that cash flow management has really been a challenge uh, because of postponed programming and a lot of groups receiving temporary government aid. Um, and we've also relaxed our 75% government funding cap for programs. Um, again, you know, community and volunteer involvement has really been impacted. Um, we have also relaxed the requirement for programs to have been delivered for 12 months at the time of application for returning applicants and um, also for new programs that are addressing COVID-19 related community needs. And we've introduced one new temporary uh, response measure for this year, and that is that our grant funding can be used to create new paid positions in 2021, and hopefully that will help organizations retain the people they need and increase their capacity. Um, in addition, um, we do update our guidelines every year. Um, this is in response to the input and feedback that we receive throughout the year from stakeholders, from applicants, um, and from our staff. Um, these updates generally include policy changes and clarifications or improvements to our existing policy. Um, and all of this is with the intention to uh, continually improve our program. So some examples of things that we've changed for this year, um, we've added a notification to applicants that publicly available materials and information on an applicant's, um, uh, on either your organization or your programs um, may be reviewed as part of your application assessment. And that's just help us answer questions that might come up that aren't necessarily answered through the application itself. Um, we've updated our organization eligibility criteria just to provide greater clarity on organization membership and additional information on the board of directors election and governance requirements. So this isn't a new policy, it's just clarifying what was already there. And we've added in a new, uh, couple of new subsectors for the sport and arts and culture sector, just to better capture programming in these sectors. So for this year, the, the changes um, for the sort of policy and clarification piece was pretty minor. The, the biggest thing was really just adding those COVID-19 temporary measures in, in writing um, for our guidelines for the year. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we have our community uh, gaining grants program guidelines. They are our main policy document for our program and they include all the information that you'll need to know about our program. Um, so the guidelines have these new changes that I mentioned reflected uh, within um, and all the information on our program. So uh, whether you're new or returning, we definitely encourage everyone to read through these in advance of submitting your application. Um, it's going to cover off everything you need to know to have a successful application. Oops, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> okay, um, program essentials. So what is our program about? So we have $140 million annually, um, and we give this out through two programs. So we have our $135 million community gaming grant program, and that is to help not-for-profits deliver their ongoing programs. 
We also have a separate $5 million capital project grant program, and that's again aimed toward not for profits, but um, to help them with capital projects or acquisitions. Um, all of this is funded with provincial commercial gambling revenue. Um, a question that I often get is whether um, the closure of casinos has an impact on our budget. Um, certainly uh, gaming revenues will be down because of that, but we also know that online gaming revenues have gone up. Um, we, we, like everyone else, we, we won't know what our total budget is until the budget is released by the government on April 20th, um, but we're operating um, on a sort of status quo basis um, under the assumption that we'll have our, our full budget. So for the time being, we, we're, we're going ahead as normal. So our program, it's not a competitive grant process. If an organization and their programs uh, are eligible, they will receive funding. Um, in 2020, 2021, so last grant year, um, nearly 95% of applicants who applied did receive grant funding. Um, we haven't done the full total yet, so this is kind of an interim number. Uh, we're just finishing off with the last of those um, applications, but um, it, it is a little bit higher than normal, and I think that's in part due to the temporary relaxation of some of our policies because of COVID. Our average grant amount is around $25,000, and that really reflects the, the sort of sheer number of um, local organizations that are, are receiving some grant funding. Um, and annually, we fund about 5,000 organizations across the province, and, and what that means is that um, really in every community, there is an organization that is getting some kind of funding assistance from the Community Gaming Grant Program, um, which is fantastic. So we support programs in six different sectors. Um, obviously, there are many different not-for-profits that deliver different types of programming. Um, we, we separated our program into these different sectors just to help us organize our intakes and notifications. Um, help us track funding to different areas and help us specify the kinds of programs and services that our program supports under each sector. So I'll, I'll run through each just to give you a sense of what they're about. So um, arts and culture is really just uh, for us, it's about programs that provide public access to and uh, or preservation of the arts heritage or culture. So examples of programming under this sector would be things like performing arts, um, music education, art galleries, fairs and festivals, museums, et cetera. We have a sport intake, and that's really around community-based amateur sport programs um, for organized competitive physical activity. So this would be, you know, all your typical kinds of sports for both youth and adult leagues. So um, hockey, baseball, basketball, that sort of thing. Um, as well, we provide funding for Special Olympics and seniors games. We have our environment sector, and that's about um, programs that revitalize, protect, uh, or provide education on ecosystems and the environment. So some ex examples of programming under this sector would be things like conservation programs, um, land stewardship, uh, outdoor education, climate change adaptation, um, as well as we provide some funding to um, animal shelters and, um, and uh, wildlife centers and things like that. Um, public safety, these are, are really about programs that enhance and support public safety initiatives. So programming that we see under this sector, are things like volunteer firefighting, search and rescue, um, outdoor recreation is under public safety as well. Um, as well as disaster relief and emergency preparedness. Um, in the human and social services sector, it is our largest sector. It really is, is kind of a catch-all. Um, the way that we kind of put a ring around it is that it's programs that significantly contribute to the quality of life in a community or group. So things that we fund under this sector are things like child care, um, services or programs for people with disabilities, um, mental health and counseling programs, um, community building programs, um, seniors uh, activities and senior centers, as well as service clubs. So things like the Lions and, and Kinsmen would fall under this sector. And finally, we provide funding to parent advisory councils and district parent advisory councils. Um, and that's really to support the enhancement of extracurricular opportunities for um, children in the K-12 uh, school system. 
And we fund that at a rate of uh, $20 per student for the school based on the previous year's enrollment. So we have a few different funding levels depending on the sort of size and scope that, of the organization and the area that they serve. So local organizations can receive uh, funding up to a maximum of $100,000. Regional organizations can um, apply up to 225,000 and provincial level organizations can apply for up to 250,000. Um, funding levels aren't guaranteed and what that means is that we have a fixed budget and we are a demand driven program. Uh, so we carefully manage our, our budget to make sure that we can support all eligible organizations. Um, and the level of funding is really awarded based on the size and scope of the programming that's been presented in the organization's application. Um, and through the demonstrated financial need that's shown in the program actuals and budget and, and the program description that is part of the application. So I'll talk a bit about um, organization eligibility now. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a program for not-for-profits. So um, one of the key criteria is that an organization must be a not-for-profit. They must also deliver programs and services directly to the community. They must have an open membership, which means that anyone with an interest in joining the organization can do so and be involved. The uh, organization must have a volunteer board and a voting membership. And that voting membership must be twice the size of the board. So say you had um, five board members, you would need to have at least 11 uh, voting members. The board members must be democratically chosen by their voting membership and at least two thirds of them must reside in BC. And um, which is, this is under the Societies Act as well, but board members do not receive remuneration for acting in their capacity as a board member. So an ineligible organization would, um, the flip side of being not-for-profit would be if they were for-profit. Um, we also don't provide grant funding to member-funded societies. So that's a separate, um, classification under the Societies Act, you're either a, a member funded society or a not member funded society. Um, if, uh, we don't provide any funding to political parties, political action groups or lobby groups, uh, nor do we provide funding to any level of government um, from federal down to local. Uh, similarly, we don't provide funding to um, facilities or schools uh, like hospital or healthcare facility or education institution, um, nor do we provide funding to any provincially or municipally operated facility like a library, museum, rec center, things like that. So um, in addition to the organization's eligibility, the organizations must also demonstrate financial eligibility to be considered for a grant. Um, this is assessed to ensure that the organization sustainability and financial health um, and to ensure that our funding is going toward organizations and programming that has a financial need. Um, so there are a few different uh, documents that we request um, in order to assess that financial eligibility. Um, so this would be a revenue and expense statement for the organization's previous fiscal year. So their most recently completed entire fiscal year. Um, a balance sheet for the previous fiscal year uh, and a budget for the current fiscal year, as well as any accompanying notes that would be um, included with the financial statements for the previous fiscal year. Um, there's a lot more details on the organization's financial eligibility criteria um, in our guidelines in section 3.3. So this is a, kind of a, a very um, general overview, uh, but there's a lot more information in there. So program eligibility. So our program is really meant to support programs. It's, it's not meant to... Um, pay for organizational costs. It's, it's to be able to enable organizations to deliver their programs. So because of that, applications are submitted on a program basis. Um, and, and what that means, you know, we provide funding for the programs, not necessarily for the organization itself. Um, the way we define a program is that it's an ongoing service activity or series of activities. And the program must benefit the community, respond to a community's needs, and be accessible and open to all community members. Um, 
normally our, our criteria is that a program must be delivered for at least 12 months before it's eligible for funding. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for this year, return applicants whose programming has been affected by COVID-19 will not have their funding levels negatively impacted if they're unable to have that continuous 12-month delivery. Um, obviously, a lot of programming was uh, disrupted or um, postponed or canceled, so we've, we've relaxed that for this year. Um, as well, any new programming that um, is responding directly to COVID-19 related community needs uh, will waive that 12 month previous delivery requirement for as well. So an eligible program normally um, must have been delivered for 12 months. As I mentioned, we are uh, relaxing that cr criteria this year. Uh, the program must be directly delivered by the applicant organization. It must be ongoing, so it's not just a one-off project, but it's something that is enduring in the community. It must provide an immediate and direct service to the community. Um, it must be accessible and inclusive, so um, there's, it's open to everyone. There are no restrictions on who can join. So ineligible programs would be um, programs that really just serve an organization's membership and are not open to the general public. Um, a program that is really just about providing financial assistance to individuals. Um, fundraising or social enterprise programs are not eligible for grant funding, um, as well as programs that um, solely operate a facility or a venue. We don't provide funding for long-term housing programs or uh, vocational training programs. Um, or do we provide funding to uh, programs that are delivered on a contract or under a funding agreement with another entity? Um, because of the fact that we are um, really interested in programs that benefit um, community members, we don't provide funding um, for programs that really primarily benefit other organizations. And kind of the, the bottom line or the sort of thing that sums all of this up is that we don't provide um, grant funding to programs that do not deliver an immediate and direct service to the community. So similar to the organization financial eligibility, um, applicants must also supply program financials to determine the program's financial eligibility. So program revenue and expense statements for the previous fiscal year and a program budget for the current fiscal year are required for each program that the organization is applying for funding for. Um, and one of the program financial criteria is that government funding cannot exceed 75% of the total program cost. Um, and one of the main reasons for this is to see that demonstrated community support for the program. So applicants must have at least 25% of their program operating costs coming from other non-government sources. So this can be through um, user fees, uh, fundraising, in-kind contributions, et cetera. Um, and if government funding exceeds that 75%, funding may be limited or denied. Um, you'll see here again uh, the asterisk uh, for, for this year. Uh, return applicants who have had their programming affected by COVID-19 won't have uh, their funding levels impacted if they're not able to meet that 75% criteria. Um, and like everything else, um, all sources of program revenue must be clearly stated in the program financials so that we're able to, to do that financial eligibility assessment. Um, again, there's more information about this in the guidelines um, if you want to uh, dig deeper into that. So I've mentioned a few different financial documents um, that are required for the application. So I've just tried to summarize it here um, and I'll just quickly go over it again. So um, at the organization level, uh, we require an organization balance sheet for the most recently completed fiscal year. Uh, we require an organization revenue and expense statement, um, otherwise known as the organization's actuals for the most recently completed fiscal year. We require an organization budget for the current fiscal year. And then for the program financials, for each program that an organization is applying for, we require the program revenue and expense statement um, for the most recently completed fiscal year, the program budget for the current fiscal year. And if your organization is claiming any in-kind um, volunteer um, hours or donations, um, there would be a separate um, in-kind contribution summary that was included with your program financials for the most recently completed fiscal year. 
So spending the grant. So grant funds are really intended to cover costs that are essential to the direct delivery of an approved program. Um, grant funds are not intended to fund an organization's core operating costs. So um, some of the things that um, can be, uh, the grant funds can be used for rather, um, it's for wages of existing paid positions for the program, um, rent utilities and insurance that's related to the program, um, program supplies, office supplies, um, internet and phone costs, any program advertising that you need to do, um, any rental or purchase of equipment that's needed to deliver the program, um, some travel uh, that's essential to the direct delivery of the program within BC is allowed. Um, and there uh, is the ability to um, have a separate sort of special approvals if uh, out of province travel is required for the delivery of your program. Um, right now, I don't think a lot of that is happening, but that is something that does exist. So um, as I mentioned, grant funds are not intended to fund an organization's core operating costs, but an organization can allocate a percentage of your core operating costs like wages, rent, etc. Um, toward a program if the costs are directly related to the program delivery. So I'll just give an example here. Um, say you have an employee who spends 40% of their time working on an eligible program. Um, in this example, this would be a museum display. Um, and the remainder of the time, 60% of the time, they're working on non-eligible programs or general organizational or administrative duties. So say that in this example, they've got a gift shop, they do some grant writing, they've got board work or other admin tasks that are assigned to them. In that instance, um, the organization could prorate and have 40% of the employee's wages included as a program expense. So, so that is, is some of the way that some of those, um, I guess, core costs can be covered if they are related to the delivery of the program. In addition to regular program funding, applicants can request funding um, in their application for separate one-off things like minor capital projects. And that would be capital projects that are under $20,000. Um, they must be related to um, and essential for the delivery of an approved program. Um, things that we've seen organizations apply for would be things like uh, a renovation or a wheelchair wrap or some accessibility upgrades. Um, as well, uh, organizations can apply for a one-off capital acquisition uh, purchase. So again, this would be required for the delivery of an approved program. We do require quotes if it is over $5,000. Um, and things that organizations have applied for would be things like computer um, or other equipment, um, even vehicles in some cases. Um, again, it must be related to uh, the delivery of the program. Um, a request for either minor capital project or acquisition funding um, can't be done sort of separately without a program. It needs to be included um, as a part of the funding request for one of the programs that you are funding for. So um, it, you couldn't apply just for a minor capital project or a capital acquisition alone. It has to be part of um, your regular program um, application. Um, and demonstrated that it is related to the program that you're delivering. So uh, organizations must have a separate account for receiving, holding, and dispersing gaming funds. Um, all the grant funds are just deposited into the organization's gaming account. Um, all eligible expenses should be paid directly from the gaming account and, and grant funds may be transferred here by check or electronically. Um, from the gaming account to your general account um, for any reimbursement purposes, but it is a, a bit cleaner if it all just comes from your gaming account. Um, this can be done through a check or board approved electronic transfer um, and the documentation. Um, like everything, we require that the invoices and receipts must be retained for five years um, in case of audit or things like that. So grants must be spent um, within 12 months from when they were received. Uh, funding can also be used for costs that were incurred in the same fiscal year that the grant was received. So I'll give you an example. Um, if your organization's fiscal year runs from January 1st to December 31st, so the general, the normal calendar year, um, and you receive a grant on April 1st, you could either spend your grant forwards 12 months till April 1st of 2022, 
or you can spend it kind of backwards um, to the be beginning of your fiscal year, which started on January 1st. So any costs that were incurred between January 1st and March 31st of that fiscal could be essentially back paid. So um, all grant funding must be reported in our gaming account summary report. It's kind of the only um, reporting that is required for our program. Um, all organizations that receive community gaming grants or have previously received a grant and still have money in their gaming account have to submit a, a gaming account summary report or a gasser, that's what we call it. This must be submitted within 90 days of the organization's uh, fiscal year end. And the gaming account summary report um, really just shows us the balance at the beginning of the fiscal year, um, any grants received, uh, funds that have been dispersed, and the balance uh, that you have carrying forward at the end of your fiscal year. Uh, we also require a 300 word max description of the how the community benefited, um, what you were able to put on for the year, um, and any of the programs and services that were supported by the grant funding. Um, organizations must uh, submit all recent gaming account summary reports in order to receive another community gaming grant or a capital project grant. And the gaming account summary report really just helps us to ensure that grant funding is only used on eligible expenses. Uh, there are examples of um, a gaming account summary, like filled out gaming account summary reports on our website, as well as the blank gaming account summary report that organizations can access um, to complete their own. So applying for the grant. So here are our application intake uh, periods for all of our sectors this year. Right now we have two that are open. Um, arts and culture has been open since February 1st and sport has been open since March 1st. Um, next up will be the parent advisory councils and district parent advisory councils, which opens April 1st. And uh, the human and social services sector, as I mentioned earlier, is opening a bit early this year on June 1st. Following that, we'll have environment and public safety, which both open on July 1st. And then we'll have our capital project grants. Um, you'll note we don't have dates just yet. Um, these haven't been established, uh, but typically it is open in the summertime. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, I would definitely check back on our website for announcements of when that, uh, that date has been released. So all applications take place electronically. So you can apply online on our website. Um, we don't accept paper applications. Um, any documentation that is required for the application must be either attached to the application or emailed in after the fact. Um, if you do opt to email, email things after the fact, it, uh, there's a two week period that you can um, submit those um, outstanding documents. Uh, before you apply, it's definitely advisable to review the program guidelines that I had mentioned earlier. Um, as well as all the resources on our website. We've got quite a few. There's um, pre-application checklists. We've got sample financial statements of those, all those financial statements that I was talking about earlier. We've got frequently asked questions as well as um, application tutorials. So there's plenty of resources to help you through. Um, if your application is denied or you'd like to request that the branch reconsiders their decision, you may file a reconsideration request. So these reconsideration requests must be made within 30 days of receiving your notification letter. And it must state the reasons why the decision should be varied or overturned. Um, we don't look at new information or documentation at that time. It's really just to make sure that the decision was made um, in an administratively fair way and there were no misinterpretations. Um, final decisions are made within 90 days of receiving the request. Um, and I guess I'll also say too, if you have questions about your, your notification letter, but you don't necessarily want to appeal anything, um, you can always get in touch with the branch um, for just clarification. Um, and we're, we're happy to help and it, you'll get an answer in, in a much quicker time. So here is some tips and advice for applying. Um, you know, I've <laughs> said it a few times now, but reading the most recent program guidelines is really where you start. Um, checking out those pre-application checklists are gonna make sure you have everything in order to submit. 
Um, if you're able to, having a professional review your financials is, is definitely a good step to just make sure that everything looks good there. Um, if you do have specific questions, you can phone a grant analyst. Uh, we have someone available on the phones every day. Um, for all of your uh, attachable documentation, um, if you have it all ready to go as a Word or a PDF for upload in your application, that's going to make the application itself a lot smoother to go through. Um, if you have any items that were mentioned on your previous notification letter, um, it definitely helps if you take a look at that and make sure that all of those items are addressed. And again, if there's any questions about that, you can get in touch with a grant analyst or you can get in touch with uh, myself and the outreach team. Um, <clears throat> and related to that, um, it, it never hurts to include a cover letter that ad addresses the previous notification letter and, and what you've done to rectify some of those items that were pointed out. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, you cannot receive a grant if your um, gaming account summary report for the previous year is outstanding. So make sure that that has been submitted. And the last but, uh, but not least, um, early, the earlier you can apply in your intake period um, is, is always an advantage uh, because we assess our applications in the order that they're received. Um, there, there's no advantage in terms of receiving more funding if you do it earlier. As I mentioned, everyone who is eligible does receive that funding, um, but it just means that you'll be able to get um, an answer a lot quicker, especially because we do tend to get a lot of the um, applications submitted in the last two weeks. So um, our volume goes up quite considerably and then the response time, um, as you can imagine, would go down. Um, in addition to that, I would just say, you know, tips for submitting a good application. Um, having clear financial statements um, is, is huge. It's, it is a big part of our assessment process. Um, so for that, I would say, you know, take a look at the templates that are on our website and the example documents. And as much as you're able to model after that and make sure that, you know, there's no, you know, all your amounts reconcile with each other and there's no kind of big questions that would be raised by somebody looking in from the outside. I think that that's, that's pretty big. Um, having an informative and easy to understand program description for all of your programs is another big thing. Um, all of our analysts are, are generalists. They're not experts in any one area. So um, we can only go by what we're told um, in terms of what it is that you do with your program. So answering all of those key questions, you know, the who, why, where, when, what um, really kind of helps to paint the picture for us to understand what it is that you're doing and how you do it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, just making sure that any outstanding issues um, that were raised in previous notification letters have been rectified, um, definitely important. Um, and having those uh, gaming account summary reports submitted are, are probably the, the main four things that I would say um, are really important for a good application. So now I'll talk a bit about our separate um, capital project grant program. So this year will be <clears throat> the fifth year of our program. Um, the objective of the capital project grant is to help not-for-profits complete capital projects. Um, and these capital projects are always like everything aimed to provide significant benefit to communities. So the program is specifically for capital projects with a total cost between, <clears throat> excuse me, 20,000 to 1.25 million. And we are strict on that amount. Uh, the reason is that we're looking for projects that are really within the scope of a not-for-profit. Um, we're not looking to fund mega year or mega projects or multi-year projects. Uh, the main sectors for the community gaming grant program also apply here. So, um, you know, an organization would still need to fall within one of those six sectors. And our organization eligibility is the same as the Community Gaming Grant Program. So for the program, uh, between 20 and 50% of the total cost of a project might be, may be funded. Uh, and the percent really depends on the, the cost of the project and the total grant amount. Um, we provide grants um, up to a max of $250,000. Um, so for example, if you had a $1.25 million uh, project um, and you received the maximum grant amount of $250,000, that $250,000 would equal 20% of your funding. So that just kind of gives an example of the uh, between the 20 and 50% of the total cost of the project. 
Um, matching funds for the applicant organization are required, and these must be on hand at the time of application. Um, you can have bona fide commitments um, or promissory letters, but funding in hand is definitely a stronger case for the application. Um, successful applicants will get what they've applied for, um, assuming that all those requirements are met. So if you've been able to demonstrate that your project costs X amount of dollars and you need 50% um, from us to be able to complete it, um, we will help you to do that. Um, and the last thing to mention, uh, which is different about this program is that the assessment process is competitive. So applicants are definitely encouraged to put forward their strongest application possible, just you know, knowing that other organizations are, are doing the same. Um, we don't have the intake dates yet for the capital project grant, um, but as I mentioned earlier, that's typically open during the summer, but check back on our website for any further announcements on that. Um, organizations can only submit one application per year for the capital project grant, and it can be for only one project. So uh, we're not looking for phases of projects or cascading projects. It's one complete and total project that you're looking for assistance with. Um, there should only be one lead in the application or, or project. Um, organizations can definitely get the support of other organizations, but um, really we're looking for um, the entity that has the responsibility for it, and that must be clear in the application. Um, organizations can still apply for the regular community gaming grant. Um, these two programs are considered separately from each other. And like our regular guidelines, um, the Capital Project Program has its own sector guide that's updated every year. We're just in the process of updating that right now, and hopefully that'll be out in the near future. So um, we, we do have project eligibility criteria for this program. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there can only be one grant application per applicant and only one project per grant. So applicants can only apply for one of these project categories. Um, so for example, an organization could apply for um, a whole bunch of building restoration um, activities, but they couldn't also apply for a fleet of vehicles. So it's, it's just picking one. Um, and the reason we wanna see one and not kind of a, a mix and mash is that we're looking to fund the successful completion of one total project that will be um, immediately available to benefit the community, not a bunch of half completed projects. So the three categories that we have are facilities. So that's for um, constructing or renovating um, existing facilities sorry, facilities, um, and this would be under the ownership of the applicant organization. Um, we have community infrastructure projects, and that's really about public amenities um, that are available to everyone. Um, these are typically on public lands. And we have acquisitions, so this would be the purchase of fixed capital assets for long-term ownership and use by the applicant organization. So a whole bunch of things can fall under that category. We've seen things like vehicles, um, computer uh, systems, sport equipment, um, very technical equipment that's required for that sector, um, things like that. Uh, we will not fund research or development. Um, this program is really about uh, funding those hard assets. Um, each project category has its own eligibility criteria, similar to the community gaming grant program. Uh, but generally speaking, they include things like making sure that the project is uh, for community benefit and accessible to the public upon its completion, and that the organization has the right to build or modify land, um, and that would be demonstrated through things like proof of ownership or a lease or a letter of permission. Um, so as I mentioned, it is a competitively scored program. So here's a, a bit of a breakdown of how we, we assess these applications. Um, there is a portion allocated to community benefit. So, you know, we want to know why the project is needed and how the community will benefit. Uh, inclusiveness and accessibility. So we want to understand how many people will benefit um, and ensuring that it's open and inclusive to everyone. For project feasibility, we want to see that there's a sound plan in place to ensure that the project will start after funding is provided and it will be completed on time. Um, for successful applicants, funding must be spent within 36 months of receiving it. Um, and the project timeline should really show how the project would be completed in that timeframe. 
um, as well, the project must uh, start within 12 months of receiving the funding. Um, for financial considerations, it's, it's the biggest portion allocated to the assessment. Um, not only do we want to see that there's a viable plan for executing the project, but we want to see that there's a sort of solid financial um, piece on, on the project. So here we would look at the total project's cost and budget. Uh, we would look at how grant funds will be used toward eligible expenses um, and that the matching funds are in place. And finally, we have a small portion uh, dedicated to environmental efficiency, and that covers things like climate or environment features or ways to reduce um, energy or operational costs. Um, this may not be applicable to all projects and applicants can certainly know where this is not applicable and why. Okay, so now I'll leave off with some resources. Um, I've mentioned several times things that are available on our website. So this is our web address where you'll find all that information. Um, there's two different ways you can contact us by email. We have a general inbox um, or there's the community outreach man manager inbox, which is um, monitored by myself and a policy analyst. Um, as well, that, that phone number that I mentioned that people can call in um, and there's someone available every day. We also have um, the BC Association of Charitable Gaming. Um, they're a provincial not-for-profit organization that works to kind of liaise between community groups and the Community Gaming Grants branch. So they receive some funding um, and that's really with the aim of providing support services to charities and not-for-profits um, for the purpose of applying for a Community Gaming Grant. So they can really help get into the application with you and answer really specific uh, questions and, and look over your application before you submit it. Um, as well, there's the British Columbia Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centers, um, and they also receive community gaming grant funding for the same purpose. Um, they have a very similar mandate to the BCACG, um, but this is focused more on um, providing support to Indigenous not-for-profit organizations. And as well, there are um, what are called community charitable gaming associations. And these are regionally based not-for-profit organizations that support their sort of uh, charities and uh, community groups in their local community um, with applications for community gaming grants. Um, and there is one uh, based in Kelowna, which is the Central Okanagan CCGA. Um, so, so they would be the ones um, for this group that I would suggest folks get in touch with. So I'll, uh, I'll kind of toggle between these two screens, but that, that is it for the sort of presentation portion of uh, my, my presentation. Um, so now um, if there's questions, I would be happy to take them. Yeah, thanks so much, Denise. Uh, I will help uh, facilitate some of those questions that have been submitted. So we'll just go sure. through the uh, chat here. Um, so uh, Ruth, Edwards from the Hospice Society says, uh, are you revisiting the reserve fund criteria which limits applications for CGG? Uh, is it fair to exclude organizations which have uh, reserves when in times of crisis, you know, COVID for example, uh, it is those reserves which keep the organization viable, especially when they are ineligible for CGGs? Okay, so um, the first thing I'll mention at the top, um, the uh, organizations who restrict funding, um, it, it does come into play uh, for their um, organization surplus, which I think is what um, what is Ruth was it um, is is referring to. So as I mentioned, for return applicants for this year, the organization surplus um, is not one of those um, criteria that will be enforced. So if your operational surplus is greater than 50% this year, you won't have your funding impacted as a result. So that's that's one thing um, because we do recognize that um, you know people's finances uh, are a bit abnormal than what they would normally be. So we're not going to be penalizing people if they're they're sitting on a lot of funds and you know they weren't able to spend it for whatever reason or there's been a an influx because of temporary government aid things like that. Um, the other piece is around restricting funds. Um, we do have criteria uh, in our guidelines um, that um, after three years, um, organizations who have restricted funds but have not spent the funds 
um, we wouldn't be considering those as restricted any longer um, because the, you know, either the organization is you know having a difficult time being able to save for whatever it is that they're they're trying to achieve um, or or whatever the case may be. Um, and then for capital type projects, um, it's up to five years. Um, in in any case, you know, I would say if if you're running into that issue, you've restricted funds, you're not able to spend the funds, and you're sort of at risk of us uh, treating those as funds that are generally available cash on hand. Um, if if you're you know you're still working toward that goal um, and you you know there's extenuating circumstances, groups can always get in touch with us. Um, but really, the the emphasis is on. Um, Anytime a group would restrict funds for a purpose, that that purpose can be met. Otherwise, you know, a, a group's membership might be wondering why um, an organization is sitting on funding, um, especially in a, a crisis situation, as you mentioned, um, and, and isn't maybe releasing those funds to, to help the organization stay afloat. So um, if there are more specific questions on that for your particular organization, um, I would definitely encourage you to get in touch with us um, at the branch and we can discuss further. Okay, hey, thanks, Denise. Uh, Scott from the Okanagan Screen Art Society says, do you have to have already been getting or applying for program grants to apply for a capital project grant? Uh, nope, um, it, it, it would just go through the same process um, as your community gaming grants. We would just make sure that the organization was eligible to, to receive funds um, as, as part of the sort of organization criteria we have for both of the programs, but you do not have to have been in receipt of community gaming grant funding to be eligible for the capital project grant. Okay, thank you. Uh, Susan from the Downtown Vernon Association asks, do you know if business improvement areas are successful in leading gaming grant applications? I don't think that they would. Um, it would it would all depend on you know again do they meet the organization criteria and I, I'm not as familiar with BIAs um, in terms of how they're set up um, but if uh, you know if if they can demonstrate all the same criteria as uh, as we suggest for other not for profits I don't see why not but if there's some kind of um, attachment to say municipal government um, or or some kind of arrangement like that that might not be the case but. I would, I would definitely suggest to take a look at our, our organization criteria and, and if you know you feel you meet all of those but you still have other questions to, to get in touch because it really comes down to um, the, the constitution and bylaws and how that organization is um, kind of set up and, and being funded. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vicki from the Winter Carnival Society asks, can a society apply for a community gaming grant if they are in the process of becoming operational? No, um, the what it what we fund are programs that have been in operation for over 12 months. So if uh, if a group is just getting started, they wouldn't be able to meet that criteria essentially because they haven't been um, in play for over 12 months. So this is about us providing funding for organizations who have been doing this for a while um, and we're providing funding to, to help them deliver their existing programming. So in this case, I would say not as they're getting started, but as, as they're up and running and they've got a program that they can show that there's been 12 months of activity, then they could apply and, uh, and get some funding that way. Hey, thank you. Got a question here from uh, Chelsea from the BCSPCA. She asks, uh, if an organization is province-wide with many different local branches, uh, would it be up to the organization to apply as a whole once, or would applications be open to individual branches uh, for programming grants? Not counting? Yeah, good good question. So we, we do have examples of this um, on, on both sides. So we'll have um, like a provincial entity with local chapters. Um, and it is the provincial entity that applies and then disperses those funds to their local chapters, or we have um, local chapters who apply individually. And, and what the distinction really is, and it's, it is kind of up to your organization to decide, but it, it kind of depends on the structure. So um, if it's the case that the provincial body is overseeing everything that all the local chapters do, um, they're the ones who are controlling the funding, they're the ones who are controlling the programming, uh, we would consider that as one 
kind of provincial entity. Um, there are other arrangements where a local chapter has their own board, they set up their own programming, they're in control of their own finances, and they're, they're aligned with the provincial um, chapter, but they're not necessarily um, falling under and must do what the provincial chapter says. Um, in that case, if that local entity can demonstrate that they have, you know, control and ownership over their own programs and their own funding, then we would fund that uh, local chapter separately. Um, so it kind of depends how you're set up. So it would definitely take a look at, again, like your constitution and bylaws and what the arrangement is um and and see what you know what kind of configuration um applies to your situation hey thank you another question popped in here another one from scott from the okanagan screen art society says uh follow up to vicky's question do capital grants require an organization to have been running the program uh for 12 months that the capital grant is supporting or helping expand so he's given an example here uh, we've been running weekly arts nights and are taking over the venue to continue to expand that programming uh, we plan on some accessibility improvements yeah so it, it, it does have the same criteria that um, you know the pro that the organization in order for them to be eligible, there needs to be that 12 months of programming that has been demonstrated. So they're not just brand new out of the box. There is some ongoing eligible programming aspect that the project is likely related to. So it does share the same criteria in terms of um, the organization eligibility and, and the program eligibility is, is shared between the two programs. So for the capital project grant program, um, the project um, would be related to a program that has been in place for over 12 months. All right. Well, seeing no more questions and we are close to time here, we'll call it uh, as a successful webinar. So thank you, Denise, so much for your time. It's greatly appreciated You're welcome. your availability here to help answer some questions and ensure that, uh, you know, our members are more successful in their their applications. And uh, to you members, thank you for attending. You know, we appreciate your membership and are happy to help provide these web webinars and facilitate them for you. So uh, with that, I will bid everybody adieu and thank you so much again. We will also provide a recording of this to, to uh, all members as well, just so you can, again, see the answers and uh, have access to those uh, contacts that were provided as well. So thanks again. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.